Okay. A text for sermon, the sermon today comes from the scriptures that Dean read. Uh, my text actually is John chapter 9, verse 4. Nine, John 9, 4. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. Now, how does God regard time? Because God's command and his commission, I submit, have urgency. Now, that might sound like a little bit of contradiction to what it says in Second Peter about a day being like a thousand years to God. If you hold on just a few minutes, you'll understand what I mean when I say God, man's mission, have urgency. You know, an example, an example of the urgency and haste uh, of God is actually in Jesus, whose task was so compelling and urgent that he crowded everything in and completed this this huge task in three and a half years. It was so urgent and so compelling that he completed his task in three and a half years. So it was a big one. But there was some urgency there. Now concerning this urgency of God, I want to consider I want to consider a couple of things today. And then based on a couple of facts I want us to consider two questions. First, the true fact. One, we are slow to do God's work. That's one fact. The other fact is that God is urgent. Now, first fact, we are slow to do God's work. Everything, everything, by the way, is urgent to us. Hurry up, do this. Hurry, do that. Everything is urgent to us except, except the things we do for God. But we have to eat faster, learn faster, travel faster, sell faster, hurry up. But when it comes to the things of God or the church, we're content in working at a leisurely pace. There's no sense of urgency, you know, uh, there's none at all. While we rush, 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 we got to make a living. But when it comes to serving God, we say, well, we'll get to it. One of these days, there's no hurry. We have plenty of time. That's what we say. Now, if we're honest, right? Now, this is a little kind of a funny story. There's a story told of three apprentice devils that will come to the earth to finish their apprenticeship. They were talking to Satan, the king of the devils, about their plans to tempt and ruin humanity. The first apprentice devil says, I will tell them there's no God. The devil said, no, that's not going to work. People know there's a God. The second one said, I will tell them there's no hell. No, the devil said, most people deep down in their hearts know that there is a hell and judgment will come. The third one said, I will tell them there's no hell. The devil said, you go and tell them that, and you will ruin them by the thousand. There's no urgency. That's how procrastination works. You know, procrastination doesn't say, I'm not going to do this. That's, you know, that's too final. Procrastinate, rather, procrastination says, I'll get to it later. I'll get around to it. The fact is, that we are slow to do God's work. And the next fact I point out is that uh, if one was, you know, we're slow to do God's work. The other fact is that God is urgent. Now, let me get back to the Second Peter verse uh, and try to deal with some confusion about the urgency of God in light of that passage of Scripture. Now, that passage of Scripture, by the way, uh, say the second Peter chapter three verses eight and nine. Do not overlook this one fact, beloved, 
that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should be repentant. Now, that sounds like God's not urgent, right? Now, when we read this, we think of God having really no concern of the passage of time. So we, and we focus on the thousand years in God's sight being one day. Now, seldom do we focus our attention on the statement the other way around. Let me give you an example. Anyone who has watched a loved one into the bedside of a dying loved one would understand how a few hours or days seems like an eternity. You know, we have a friend uh, who has who's had several strokes, had several strokes at least a, a couple of months ago, and she's not responded at all for at least two months. And she has three children and a lot of grandchildren and cousins and relatives and friends. Just imagine, imagine how long these two months have felt to them. Now, now think how, about how it must be with God as he watches the dying multitude who he loves and for who Christ died, as he watches them go into eternal, eternal damnation. Our delay, our delay in sharing the gospel must weigh heavily on God's heart. God's love demands that we be urgent. God love, God's love demands that we be urgent in our witness of him. Now, the New Testament is really an urgent book. Uh, let me give you a couple examples. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 7, uh, Jesus said this. Then to, to, to Mary, when she came to the tomb, then go quickly and tell his disciples that have risen, that have, he has risen from the dead. This is the angel talking to Mary. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, see how he told you. Quickly, go quickly, go fast. In Acts chapter 12, verse 7, it says, And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, Peter, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him and said, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. The only time, the only time that Jesus asked his disciples to wait around or tarry around was when he told them to wait and tarry to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. All of us, Jesus' other command to his disciples was go quick, go quickly. The only time he said wait was wait for the Holy Spirit. Right? Luke 24, 49 says, And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power on that. Everything else that he commanded his disciples to do, he wanted them to do it quickly. Well, that's the two, two, two facts. We're slow to do God's work. Other fact is that God is urgent. Now the two questions that arise from these two facts. First question, why are we so slow? And the second question is, what results from our lack of urgency concerning God's work? First, why are we so slow? Well, there are several reasons. One, we're slow because we don't realize how important God's work is. We think primarily of our earthly wealth and our material obligations, and we let God's business get done the best it can get done. People often want, we often want God to hurry, especially when his presence would end our suffering and our sorrow. We want God to be in a hurry. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Make haste. As David said in Psalm 7, Make haste for God to deliver me. Psalm 
seven. So, but, but we want God to hurry, but we are slow, right? But we want God to be content and wait until we have had time to do our thing, until we've had time to to to, to meet every obligation that we have, or there's a more convenient time for us. We want God to wait, but we want Him to hurry up. So. We're slow because we don't realize how important God's work is. We're slow because we can't see. We don't discern the flawless and unseen operation of spiritual laws and forces. We're slow because we can't really discern the operation of spiritual laws and forces. Now, God works silently, and he works unseen, but he works. And we, we, so what we have to remember is that time, this is why we have, God wants us to be urgent. Time is running out for those who are not Christians. Time is running out. Let me give you an example. The example was, was uh, uh, with Jonah. Uh, in Jonah chapter 3, verse 4, we know the story of Jonah, but Jonah chapter 3, verse 4, you, we know that Jonah, God told Jonah to go to the people, preach to the people of Nineveh, uh, that they were going to be destroyed. Jonah didn't want to go. He went and got a ship on a ship, had a storm. Uh, eventually, he was thrown overboard. Jonah 3, 4 says, after the fish, big fish, had thrown him up, vomited him on the shore, and Jonah realized, hey, I should have gone on and done what God told me to do. Jonah chapter 3, verse 4. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out in 40 days, and then none of us shall be saved. And we know what happened, right? We know that Jonah went through a transformation when he was in the belly of the whale. So his assignment got really urgent to him. And he, he decided he needed to go and do quickly what God wanted him to do. As a result, as a result of Jonah's urgency and passion in what he was saying, what happened, right? Jonah 3, 4, again. Jonah began to go in the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, yet 40 days, and Nineveh will be away. Notice what this said. Jonah called out. It was urgent. He had an urgent message. Now, this wasn't the first time Jonah cried out, by the way. Jonah cried out when he was in the belly of the fish. He cried out then. God answered his prayer, and the fish threw him up on the shore. So Jonah knew how urgent his message was. So what happened as a result of Jonah's urgency? Look at Jonah chapter 3, starting in verse 6. I'm going to read through uh, verse 10. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, moved his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and set in ashes. And he issued a proclamation uh, and published throughout me. By the decree of the king and his nobles, that neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let uh, man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn away from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from the evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. As with Jonah, our message, the message of the gospel, must be delivered with urgency. No, we're slow. Because we don't understand the urgency of God. 
There are always people urging you to hurry up, hurry up and buy this, hurry up and buy that. You know, these are material things. God is not concerned with material things. God's reason for urgency is because he doesn't want any to perish. God doesn't want any to perish, so he has given us an urgent message to deliver to them. Now, our delay in delivering sharing the gospel uh, must really weigh heavily on God. He demands urgency. It's important to us to have an urgency and a passion for reaching others with the good news of Jesus Christ because time for them is running out. So what results, what are the results from our lack of urgency concerning God's word? Uh, by a lack of urgency, I believe we bring pain to the heart of God because God has already furnished all we need, everything we need for salvation. Jesus' work of salvation was completed on the cross. Remember what Jesus said on, from the cross? When you receive the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. So God's plan of salvation is complete. Atonement has been made. So it's up to us now to deliver that message. What must God be thinking when he sees how slow we are to show others his plan of salvation? Also, by our lack of urgency, we uh, miss opportunities to share the gospel. If you miss an opportunity, you won't have it again. We miss an opportunity to share the gospel. And he's already said that the harvest is plentiful, but there aren't many of us working. Luke 10 uh, two says, and he told them the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to see our workers to his harvest field. Which, when we're slow and not urgent, we are missing opportunities that come every day. Now, our text, our text tells us when we are to work for him. It says, while it is day, while it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. So the opportunity passes. Take every opportunity that we have to share the gospel of Christ. But because by a lack of urgency, we do very little to win a lost world to Christ. Now, I read to admit that... Uh, all types of missions and missions of the world that are doing a lot of work, a lot of good work. We're doing some good work here at Christ Church. But that hardly scratches the surface. You know, this, this is uh, the gospel and salvation is urgent business. It's urgent. And this urgency stems actually from the Lord's command to make disciples of all nations. Remember the Great Commission? Right? We were supposed to do that with a sense of urgency. The Great Commission is, is Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you all the way through the end of the age. Be urgent. Do that with urgency. We need to daily focus our minds on the fact that the kingdom of God is near. 
you know, we hear a lot of all the stuff that's going on in the world today. You hear a lot of people talking about, well, the end is coming, Christ is coming. Well, if that's the case and that's where you feel, get, with some urgency, warn the nation. No, we cannot wait. Nowhere in Scripture is there a call to receive Christ tomorrow. The emphasis in Scripture is on today, on the present. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2 say, Working together with him, then we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain, for he says, in a favorable time, I listen to you, and in the day of service, I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So there's two prayers that we as Christians should pray. Now, first of all, we should pray, God, give us a vision of yourself, of a God who's in the Give us a vision of your work, its importance, its urgency, and give us a vision of ourselves, how slow and lackadaisical we are. Please forgive us. Because the day is coming when there will be no more time. No more time. Matthew chapter 24, verses 36 through 44. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father only. For, as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in, giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. We're running out of time. We're running out of time. The second prayer would be this. God, help us to realize that the king's business requires haste. Show us how great your program is, how urgent your cause. Urge us on, Lord, that we may be in a hurry to do your work. I want to read Second Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9 again, but I want to add verse 10 to it. But do not overlook this fact, one fact below, that with the day, with the Lord, one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, some counselors, but his patience toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the earth, then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. God is urgent, and we should be urgent to execute the great commission. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, the most important belief that a person can accept is that you have given eternal life. And we must accept Jesus, the Son of God, to receive this eternal life. When a person rejects Jesus, they reject your testimony and cut themselves off from you. They will be eternally lost without exception. Stir up urgency within me and with the church to spread the testimony of Christ. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, those of you who have not accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, just want to say a few words. The gift of salvation is free. It's a gift that's offered to everybody. And it's simple to receive. Receive the gift of Christ in your life. You, you have to admit you're a sinner. 
But the Bible says, where it is that all that sin that comes short of the glory of God. And it says what the result of sin is, the reason of sin is death. Submit the sinner. Two, second, believe that Jesus Christ is God's son and that he died for you. You all know this scripture, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believed, whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So believe that Jesus is God's son and he died for you. Confess your sin to God and then confess that Jesus is Lord of your life. And we talk about this scripture every week, but that's what you need to do. Thou shalt confess with thy mouth, Romans 10, 9 and 10. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And then receive Jesus Christ into your heart. Verse 13 of Romans chapter 10 says, For whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So confess your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And then you will receive the precious free gift of salvation. Don't keep it to yourself. Tell others that you have been saved because you confess that Jesus is Lord and He's Lord of your life. Now, before we leave today, I want to let you know that I love you. God loves you. Be urgent in your witness because time is running out. Now, may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct your way and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all of so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before God, our God and Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless you. Thank you.